If Israel does respond, what does that look like? So here for more is our military and this retired air vice marshal, Sean Bell. Sean, thank you so much for joining us once again here on Talk TV in prime time. So um, we talked about uh, various different kinds of retaliation militarily that Israel could undertake, ranging from nothing to full on. What does it look like, though, in terms of what those options militarily might be? Yeah, good evening, James. Um, what, what I would start with here, though, as a military guy, the, 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 this current iteration of the friction that's happening, your previous guest talked about retaliation for the Iranian strikes. You must remember that the Iranian strikes were retaliation for that 1st of April attack on the Iranian consulate in Damascus, where 13 people were killed, several military commanders were killed. That devastation on land, which frankly is illegal under international law to do. So from that moment, it was inevitable that Iran was going to have to do some sort of retaliation. Otherwise, it would have lost credibility in the region. So this tit for tat, in a way, has happened. Now, whilst Israel has suffered 331 collection of missiles and drones and the like, raining on them. If you look at another metric, Iran lost 13 people, including some senior commanders. Israel, through fantastic defence by the international community and Israel, um, only had one casualty, a seven-year-old girl who um, suffered. But so in context, I'm, I'm not entirely convinced by this tit for tat, otherwise you'd never stop. And that's the worry. But in terms of options, I think there's three main options that face Israel, one of which, of course, is do nothing. That's what uh, the international community is urging. And there might be other cyber and sanctions that could be involved with that. But it looks unlikely that Netanyahu would be happy with that. The other end of the spectrum is a massive wave of attacks, similar to the massive wave that was thrown at uh, Israel. Again, that will be massively inflammatory, and I suspect there will be pretty stern words behind closed doors, uh, lack of support from American allies for that. The sort of the middle ground seems to be some sort of measured attack, potentially on proxies outside of Iran itself, but um, particularly potentially in, in Syria. Military targets provide Iran with a degree of plausible deniability about it all, and maybe that's what they feel that they have to do eventually. But I reiterate, I think we've already seen a round of tip for tat. Iran has said one wave of strikes, that's it. We don't see any necess necessity to do any more. And that's why the international community is so urgently trying to um, plead with Netanyahu not to escalate and risk a much more serious global conflict. And I suppose um, you sort of touched on it because you said that the, the uh, sort of provocation, if you like, was the 1st of April attacks. And what Israel would say is, yes, but that's because the proxies uh, from Hezbollah, backed by uh, Iran, have been attacking and firing munitions into Israeli territory. And then, of course, then, as you say, it becomes a very long tit-for-tat and a very long, complicated story. But in, in terms of how this does escalate, um, just so that, you know, people understand what capabilities Israel has. I'm assuming that their military capabilities in terms of whether it's munitions, um, aircraft, drones, whatever it may be, must be some of the best in the world. They are, James, but you get into the practicalities then. Um, Iran is over a thousand miles away and for a, the Israelis to launch um, aircraft, which is their most uh, decisive capability, launch their stealth aircraft. It's almost certain that Jordan and other nations wouldn't allow them passage through their airspace because otherwise they'd be complicit in escalation. So they'd have to go a long way round uh, to get there, and that would complicate the mission. Um, if you provide ballistic missiles or cruise missiles, again, unless they route the long way around, um, it's actually practically quite difficult to launch that large scale of attack, whereas a short, sharp shock, ideally with targets potentially in Syria where they're out of sight, out of mind and far enough away and there's no civilian casualties, I suspect. In the past, you know, it's worth remembering that um, Israel has targeted 18 Iranian uh, military sites and targets over the last few years. But the attack on the 1st of April, that uh, consulate building, really struck home because the consulates and the embassies are considered Iranian territory. And um, when you start striking like that, that breaches a load of international laws. And that's why um, even at the UN Security Council, when the Israelis asked that the um, the uh, Iranians were criticised for their attack, you know, China, Russia and others said, hang on a minute, we didn't criticise when Israel uh, attacked, you know, the, the a consulate right next to an embassy. So they're 
that in a way, the international community doesn't want to get wrapped up in that cycle of iteration. It was very happy to provide support, including our own RAF, um, in the defense of Israel. But I suspect it'll be a lot more difficult for Israel to mount a credible attack on Iran because it won't get the same level of support it got in defense. Military analyst and former Air Vice Marshal Sean Bell, thank you so much for joining us here on Primetime.